Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'd like to extend a, a warm welcome to all of the participants in this virtual launch event for the second menu of indicators to measure the reverberating effects on civilians from the use of explosive weapons in populated areas. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. My name is Paul Holtam, and I'll be your moderator for this virtual launch event. I'm the head of the Conventional Arms and Ammunition Program at the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research, or UNIDIR for short. UNIDIR is an independent and autonomous institute within the United Nations, and we focus on disarmament and international security related issues. Our goal is to assist the international community to develop the practical and innovative ideas needed to find solutions to critical security problems that we face today, such as the urbanization of conflict and the use of explosive weapons in populated areas, which is our topic for discussion today. UNIDIR, of course, promotes the core values of the United Nations, and as such, we're committed to convening diversity in voices and opinions. Therefore, the views expressed in the event today are the sole re responsibility of the individual panelists, and these views do not reflect the views or opinions of the United Nations, UNIDIR, its staff members or sponsors necessarily. Before I turn over to our excellent speakers, just a few housekeeping announcements. First, of course, we're relying upon Zoom for this meeting, um, as many of us have experienced during the pandemic, this has become a critical uh, infrastructure, critical resource, but it's not perfect. And of course, we can have disruptions. It's a secure platform and all of you that have joined are using unique personalized links, but it's possible that it could indeed be compromised. And therefore, if it is, thus, we'll close down this meeting and we'll launch a new meeting on Zoom. We'll provide you all with new access links to be emailed to you immediately and we should be able to resume the event within five to 10 minutes of the closing. This is only a backup measure, and I'm confident we won't have to use it on this occasion. Uh, my colleagues have informed me we have more than 160 registrations for this virtual launch event, representing member states from various geographical regions, different UN agencies, international and regional organizations, as well as NGOs and representatives from the private sector. From my perspective, this shows not only the wide multi-stakeholder nature of the problem, but it also points to an interest in finding comprehensive solutions and efforts to find such solutions moving forward. As I mentioned a moment ago, all participants that are joining this meeting will have their cameras and microphones off. And this is because of the large number of participants, but we strongly encourage you to post your questions using the question and answer function located at the bottom of the screen at any time during this event. And as time permits, I'll relay these questions from the floor to specific panelists that you indicate or to more generally across the board. Please also indicate your name and affiliation if you so wish, as this means if we don't have time to address all of the questions, we can have bilateral follow-ups with you after this event. Indeed, should any questions go unanswered because of the time restraints, apologies in advance for this, and we'll do our utmost to ensure that we communicate with you in a timely manner. The Secretary General's 2021 report on the protection of civilians noted that 88% of those killed and injured by explosive weapons in urban areas in 2020 were civilians, compared to just 16% in other areas. Now, critically for UNIDIR's current work, the report also highlighted that such weaponry has a dramatic impact on essential civilian infrastructure, including disrupting access to vital resources and public services well beyond the immediate blast. And we're gathering this esteemed community of experts today because we understand that the impact from the use of explosive weapons in populated areas are much wider and longer lasting than the direct effects from the shock waves of the explosive blast. These indirect impacts we find are often underestimated if indeed they are estimated at all. And these so-called reverberating effects manifest themselves across a wide range of interlinked sectors that are vital for survival, well-being, and dignity of individuals and communities. At UNIDIR, we believe that documenting and understanding these effects can inform and influence the policy and practice of parties to a conflict and thus enhance the protection of civilians. And for many years, we've followed the fantastic and laudable efforts of the research community in this regard. And today, on the first anniversary of the launch of the first menu of indicators, UNIDIR is very excited to contribute to these efforts with the launch of a second menu of indicators to measure the reverberating effects on civilians from the use of explosive weapons in populated areas. And today's event, my colleagues from UNIDIR will introduce some new focus areas for this second menu, namely water, sanitation and hygiene or wash, food security, environmental degradation and economic opportunities. And in doing so, we'll be building on that first menu of indicators 
while introducing some new perspectives to explore this complex but critical topic. I think that you've heard enough from me already, so it's without any further ado, I'd like to hand over for opening remarks to the government of Germany, for which I have the privilege of introducing Mr. Albrecht von Wittke, head of the Conventional Arms Control and Confidence and Security Building Measures Division of the German Federal Foreign Office. The Federal Foreign Office generously supports the work of the Institute and the Conventional Arms and Ammunition Program in particular, making research like this possible. So Mr. von Wittke, the screen is now yours. Thank you very much, Paul. Let me just put on my camera. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to open this launch event for UNIDIA's new second menu of indicators to measure the reverberating effects on civilians from the use of explosive weapons in populated areas. Protecting civilians from the effects of conflicts in urban contexts, in particular from harm caused by the use of explosive weapons, is and has been a crucial element of Germany's efforts for disarmament and arms control. The new German government has confirmed its support for a political declaration on this topic in its most recent coalition agreement, and we look forward to the continuation of the discussions hopefully very soon. It is essential to acknowledge that the lack of compliance with existing IHL rules and principles when conducting military operations in urban environments is the primary cause for civilian casualties and for harm to civilian infrastructure. Strictly abiding by the rules and principles of IHL would provide a more effective and better protection of civilians. Since 2016, Germany has been engaging constructively in the EWIPA discussions to send out a strong message of support to established IHL rules and principles and the protection of civilians, first in the CCW and since 2019 within the framework of negotiations for a political declaration on this topic. In this process, we find it particularly crucial to set up follow-up mechanisms that will lead to effective and tangible improvements on the ground. Together with UNIDEA, we have been focusing on this extensively during the last years, resulting in very valuable workshops and several publications that helped shape discussions decisively, including a food for thought paper on opportunities to strengthen military policies and practices to reduce civilian harm from explosive weapons. In our view, concrete improvements can be achieved through the development and sharing of good military practices. Our goal is therefore to set up a continued dialogue and exchange on such good practices. Consequently, we have worked to ensure that a mandate for the creation of a working group of signatory states be adopted as part of the political declaration. This voluntary working group could then collect good practices and guidelines and assemble a toolbox. This toolbox could in turn be used as a basis for trainings and exchanges with interested armed forces. We are pleased that this operational approach has in principle been reflected in the most recent draft declaration that was presented in spring 2021. We will continue to work towards our goal of having this approach anchored in the final version of the political declaration. Another crucial element of the debate on the use of explosive weapons is that their use can set in motion a series of complex knock-on effects. These effects spread out over space and time in urban contexts with long-term consequences for civilian well-being and survival. In Germany, for instance, you still run the risk of finding explosive weapons dating from the Second World War that ended more than 75 years ago at newly opened construction sites. They are a testament for how long-lasting the legacy of the use of explosive weapons can be. It is therefore very important to not only look at the immediate effects of explosive weapons, but also on these often cited reverberating effects. The concept of reverberating effects, however, still needs to be better understood and agreed upon. Additionally, possibilities for including these effects in the considerations before an attack need to be clarified. In our view, the political declaration should therefore also include in its follow-up process exchanges and discussions on how to better understand, conceptualize, and operationalize the concept of reverberating effects. During the last round of informal consultations, we have made an initial proposal to add such an exchange in the follow-up process to the political declaration, 
and we hope that we can build on this once negotiations resume. Here again, we believe that Unidir's work should be of inspiration and can be an important basis for further discussions. This is why we applaud and happily contribute to Unidir's efforts to further develop their menu of indicators that aims to measure the integral impact of the use of explosive weapons. Working with these indicators will help us all better understand and measure those reverberating effects. This in turn can also inform future military training and decision-making, in particular when making assessments of potential impacts of weapons. Therefore, the indicators also have the potential to improve the application of and adherence to international humanitarian law. I'm therefore very much looking forward to the following exchange and discussions, and I thank you very much. On behalf of Unidir, Albrecht, thank you so much for, for those fantastic opening remarks, uh, sharing your expectations for the political declaration, but I think also going beyond that and providing a reminder of some of the concrete recommendations for measures to be taken um, so sort of implement and support that, that direct declaration going forward, in particular with regard to sort of good military practices being shared, and also this opportunities for improving understanding, coordination and operationalization, operationalization apologies, um, of the discussions around reverberating effects, a very complex issue, as you, as you rightly uh, flagged. And, and thank you again for providing us with this opportunity to, to meet today. Um, you've also set us, I think, on the right track for our panel discussion, which is to follow. We have a total of uh, four, intervention, four interventions um, coming up. I'll provide a short introduction for each speaker, and then I'll turn the screen to each of them. And we indeed hope to have sufficient time for a question and answer session if I do my moderating function correctly. So in this regard, just a reminder once more, please to all participants to use the Q&A function in Zoom located at the bottom of the screen. Pose your questions for the panelists throughout the session. There's no need to wait until all of the speakers have made their interventions. Otherwise, it's unlikely we might be able to get to answer your question during this session. We'll collate the questions and invite the panelists to address as many as possible in the available time. Now, the first intervention will be delivered by Mr. John Ford, the Deputy Director of the Disarmament and Non-Proliferation Section in Ireland's Department of Foreign Affairs. Prior to becoming a diplomat, John served as an officer in the Irish Defence Forces, where he held appointments at the tactical, operational and uh, strategic level in a variety of domestic and overseas appointments. Disarmament is one of Ireland's five signature foreign policies, and Mr Ford takes the lead on the development of Irish policy regarding conventional weapons. And again, UNIDIR is delighted that Ireland is one of our major supporters and their generous support is also helping us to move forward on this particular issue at hand today. So thank you again, John, and thank you to your government for their support. Uh, the screen is over to you. Thank you very much for the introduction, Paul, and thanks to all of UNIDIR for the continued excellence of your work. I'm extremely honored to be invited here today. Uh, from the outset, I wish to commend Alfredo and Francesca for their efforts preparing and presenting such rich data so coherently is not an easy task, yet such work is invaluable to our understanding of this extremely complex issue. Ireland remains deeply concerned about the impact on civilians, the changing nature of warfare, the stark reality of modern armed conflicts around the world is that due to their urban nature, it is civilians that are increasingly bearing the brunt. In addition to the loss of life and physical and psychological injuries inflicted on civilians, the use of explosive weapons in populated areas has significant humanitarian impacts and indiscriminate effects, destroying critical infrastructure, such as electricity supply lines, water and sanitation facilities, hospitals and roads. This often impedes humanitarian responses and hinders post-conflict reconstruction and development. Furthermore, such destruction often acts as a catalyst for the displacement of people within and across borders, putting displaced persons and refugees at greater risk of exploitation and abuse. Unidir's second menu of indicators enhances our understanding of the multi-layered pattern of harm faced by those civilians bravely trying to live through urban conflicts around the world. The research clearly sets out the devastating daily reality by drawing our attention to the knock-on effects which intersect, interact, and accumulate over time. By capturing those reverberating effects that do not fit 
neatly into statistical bundles. Unidir are informing and renewing the understanding of parties to conflict and all stake stakeholders of the reasonably foreseeable reverberating effects of explosive weapons in populated areas. And by concentrating our attention on these oft overlooked aspects, Unidir are also improving our understanding of the impact chain, as well as the interconnectivity of impacts and their disproportionate, disproportionate nature. Therefore, compelling parties to conflict and stakeholders to create impactful solutions. It's unfortunate, while Unidir's research may be new, the issue of explosive weapons in populated areas is not. The impact of explosive weapons on civilians, particularly in densely populated areas, has always been a grave humanitarian concern. I'll take a moment now to outline the, the Ireland's role in the in multilateral efforts on this issue, which you know this issue at the multilateral level has been ongoing for for over ten years now. And while these efforts have helped us to understand the scope and scale of the issues, they have not resulted in the kind of concrete outcomes necessary to address them. When Ireland launched the political declaration process in 2019, our objective was to initiate an inclusive and, tr and transparent process through which the international community could engage cooperatively on elements of a political declaration. Following two successful consultations in Geneva, we plan to finalise a political declaration during a full week of negotiations in March 2020. Unfortunately, as with all multilateral processes, our plans were frustrated by the pandemic. Despite the pandemic, though, we have advanced the process through other means. Those means have included a written consultation process during the spring and summer of 2020, online events, including a high level webinar and a fully virtual consultation on a revised draft of the declaration. We have also continued to maintain bi regular, bi regular bilateral contacts to bridge divergences and to maintain momentum in the process. There have also been a number of recent positive developments that we feel that have given the process added momentum. They include the debate uh, on the protection of civilians in urban warfare at the UN Security Council, which saw a large number of states stress the importance of addressing UEPA through the, the political declaration process. There was also the new report uh, on the impact of explosive weapons, which was launched by the president of the ICRC recently. It sets out further evidence of the devastating humanitarian harm that UEP can cause, as well as concrete policy recommendations. And while all of these efforts have advanced the declaration, delegations have been very clear that an in-person negotiation with full participation of capitals is now necessary to resolve the remaining outstanding issues and finalise the text. We had planned a three-day consultation in February, but we were forced to postpone due to the Omicron wave of, the, of, of COVID. We aim to hold further consultations in Geneva to reach agreement on a text as soon as possible. And we're working really, really hard on, on, on that. Moving now to, to the content. And this comes, of course, with the, the caveat that the text is still part of a live negotiation, but there are a number of elements I think it's really worth, worth highlighting in, in the company today. Firstly, the underlying purpose of the draft declaration is to promote actions designed to reduce civilian harm from explosive weapons populated areas and enhance the protection of civilians. The text does not establish a prohibition on the use of any specific weapon type or seek to create any new legal obligations Indeed, the draft text is explicit in stating that existing IHL provides the framework to regulate the conduct of armed conflicts and fully applies the use of explosive weapons in popular areas. What the declaration does do is acknowledge the complexities and challenges of urban warfare. It recognises that there is a problem to be addressed and seeks behavioural change to strengthen compliance with IHL. Fundamentally, we want the declaration to lead to operational changes in policy and in practice, which in turn will lead to better protection from civilians during armed conflict. While there are some divergences of views on the framing of the issue itself, the need for a civilian-centered approach underpinned by a call for the full, uh, for the full respect of IHL in armed, armed conflict is unambiguous. From Ireland's perspective, 
political declaration must have commitments that are meaningful and must bring added value. A sense of determination that we are committed to the protection of civilians and to reducing harm is essential in our eyes. In terms of the next steps, steps as I've mentioned, our most recent consultations last year saw all delegations engage constructively on the substantive issues. With over 150 interventions across three days, the input exceeded our expectations. We also received numerous written submissions from delegations with specific drafting suggestions on the text, and we really thank those delegations for providing those, which have been really useful as we've redrafted the political declaration. On the basis of those consultations and subsequent bilaterals, we have developed the revised text, which we intend to circulate as soon as we have firm dates for the postponed consultations. And as I previously mentioned, we're really hopeful that that will be in the near future. I'll bring my uh, remarks to a close very shortly, but I would just like to reiterate our support for Unidir's excellent work. Just like Unidir's first menu of indicators, the second menu of indicators contributes very valuably towards a broader understanding of the impact of the use of UEPA and assist parties armed conflict to prioritise the protection of civilians when planning and conducting operations in populated areas. For that reason, we consider them invaluable. I'll pass the floor back to you now, Paul. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, John, for elaborating upon why Ireland is, is brokering these negotiations towards the political declaration on EWIPA and, and why the reverberating effects are sort of an important aspect of this. We particularly appreciate you elaborating again upon the, the purpose and also your, your desire for a successful outcome and what that would look like with regard to the political declaration and the, the outcomes and what would follow, and indeed how the research, including what we're launching today at UNIDIR, can help to inform this political declaration. And, and I think more critically, support implementation and discussions around the operationalization uh, of the declaration going forward. Um, this to me is very important. We're also uh, disappointed that the, the negotiations didn't take place or the consultations didn't take place at the beginning of this month, but it did give my colleagues a little bit longer to polish the draft second menu of indicators. So for that, we're, we're slightly grateful for Omicron, but we, we're also like you and many others waiting for the, for the consultations to take place and looking forward for when this can move forward. Um, with that, I, I just have a reminder to you all again that you can pose your questions to, to John and the other panelists uh, in the Zoom question and answer function at the bottom of the screen. And I'm hoping that, that John's presentation, Albrecht's intervention, and also in particular, the interventions to come uh, will stimulate some more discussions here. And today's second contribution for the panel will be delivered by the co-authors of the Uniday publication, Alfredo Malare Baldo and Francesca Bato. Alfredo is a public policy specialist who joined Uniday's conventional arms and ammunition program in 2019. Uh, he was coming in to work specifically on urban contexts. And in that uh, domain, he's co-authored the counter IED capability maturity model and self-assessment tool, as well as the handbook to profile small arms ammunition in armed violence settings. And most relevant for the day, he co-authored both the first and the second menu of indicators regarding WEPA, and the first of which, of course, we presented a year ago. Alfredo's intervention will be followed by that of Francesca. Uh, Francesca is a former graduate professional with Unidea's conventional arms and ammunition program and prior to working with us, she worked for the International Crisis Group, the International Peace Institute, as well as the ICRC's regional delegation in Pretoria, South Africa. She holds a master's degree in international relations from the London School of Economics and Political Science, and a bachelor's degree in politics, philosophy, and economics from Northeastern University. But I think we're all here to hear what they've been working on during these past few months. So Alfredo and Francesca, the screen's over to you. Thank you, Paul. Excellencies, colleagues, dear participants, welcome, and thank you for attending the webinar today. We have all come together here because we consider the protection of civilians uh, a priority. Uh, next slide, please. To contribute to this shared goal, we are marking the one year anniversary of the launch of the first menu by releasing the second menu of indicators, which covers four focus areas, as has already been mentioned, WASH, food security, environmental degradation, and economic opportunities. We know that the consequences of explosive weapons use in populated areas are much broader and wider and far reaching than the loss of life from the direct effects of the explosive blast. I am of course talking about what we call the reverberating effects or third order effects as it's known in other circles. 
the damage and destruction that sets into motion a series of complex knock-on effects that spread over space and time, especially in urban ecosystems. The big question now is, how do we systematically, systematically document and measure these effects? Today, we are presenting this updated publication to better capture these complex, wide-ranging, reverberating effects. We are presenting is a tool in the toolbox for those who want to better and more systematically document these effects. As a co-author of the first menu of indicators used to say, it is also a menu, not a cookbook. This means that the document you have is not exactly a list of ingredients that you pick up, followed by instructions how to mix them, and then this promises the perfect souffle of reverberating effects. Rather, it is a menu from which you can choose one or two or three options to measure this and gives you an idea of what you and suggests ways to try it out and endeavor in this complex topic. It also doesn't cover all aspects or implications from REWIPA, but rather focuses on a specific four areas. And my colleague Francesca will expand on these four areas later. A key guiding principle of this tool is that we don't want to reinvent the wheel. And that's one of the reasons why the whole approach focuses on aspects of the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. The practical reason for this is that the SDG framework comes with a very sophisticated system of indicators. Now, the SDG are intended to measure progress. However, they can also be used to measure when key indicators are showing that something is getting worse, perhaps because of the use of explosive weapons in populated areas. Some indicators are kept as they are in the SDG framework, others needed to be slightly adapted to the context. This obviously leads us to another really big question. How can we attribute any changes in indicators we might see to the use of a weapon? To begin answering this question, please bear with me for a few methodological parts of measuring the efforts or what we call the research considerations. Next slide, please. In the research considerations that we're presenting today, we included a model for organizing our thinking around this topic, one that we call the impact chain. The impact chain is a set of parameters and is disaggregated into a sequence of first, second, and third level impacts of how the effects might build on each other. First level impacts represent damage and destruction. Second level impacts, impacts represent changes in key services caused by the damage and destruction. Third level impacts represent changes in civilian well being as a result of the changes in key services because of the damage and destruction. So, as you can see, they build on each other. And in this disaggregation, second and third level impacts can be considered reverberating effects. Next slide, please. Thank you, Theo. This graph is intended to clarify, at least we hope so, what we refer to as an impact chain. It is, of course, a simplification designed for research purposes and intended as an illustrative theoretical model. This figure does not intend to suggest that there's a mathematical relationship between point of detonation, distance, and impacts, which is not the case in urban environments, as pressure waves accelerate and vary when they move through confined spaces. It is simply intended to show a simplified and generalized sequence of how explosive weapons in populated areas can lead to reverberating effects. Next slide, please. Moving on, I would like to discuss some other research considerations that are also important for this uh, mapping of reverberating effects. The most important around this discussion is attribution. In doing this kind of research, we need to explore causal relations and identify where possible that observed outcomes are because of the shock event as, op as opposed to any other shock variable. This is hard, but it's not a reason for not trying. We also need to do so with transparency. And where causality is not necessarily clear, we outline options for different levels of certainty or uncertainty. We call the three levels of um, demonstrable causality, reasonable association, or merits deeper EWIPA related research. In addition, some statistical techniques are available to control or reduce the influence from outside factors. In the research considerations, we allow a difference in difference or diff in diff approach which, com which compares the observed outcome against the same measure, both against baseline data and against a control scenario to help with causal inference. Location and time are also crucial for research purposes. Please note that for IHL, there are no limits to reverberating effects, not physical and not temporal. However, for research purposes, especially for quantitative research, it is important to define the parameters of what will be observed. 
in terms of location, one proposal is to map several out one even larger rings growing at a geometric rate and measure how the different effects are felt and the impacts evolved throughout, throughout space. Similarly, for temporal, temporal considerations, it would be interesting to measure the same indicator at different windows of time, at a one week, one month, one year mark after a shock event to gauge how the effects evolve over time. And outcomes can be measured measure retroactively or proactively, looking into the past or into the future. Next slide, please. The menu of indicators also proposes that relevant indicators are disaggregated by gen gender and age. This is done to shed light on the differential impacts that explosive weapons can have. For a fact sheet on this topic, fact sheet on this topic, I encourage everyone to review the publications by Unidir's gender program. Another important consideration to highlight is that urban services function because of people, infrastructure, and consumables, as made clear by ICRC research. It is therefore key to gauge these interconnected dynamics when exploring performance metrics. And the indicators are designed to capture the impacts in these three considerations, people, infrastructure, and consumables. I want to stop here and underscore that what we're proposing are indicators. They're signals, if you will, not proof, and should be utilized with humility to map patterns. We really need to work together to continue building a standardized basin of data in order to draw generalized patterns of harm. Now, over to my colleague and co-author, Francesca, to walk you through the new focus areas. Over to you, Francesca. Thank you, Alfredo, and thank you everyone for joining us today. In this next section, I will be telling you a little bit more about our choice of focus areas, as well as providing some guidance and key tips on how to use the indicators. As you've heard by now, the second menu of indicators covers four new focus areas. These focus areas were selected because of their importance for the survival, well-being, and dignity of civilians. In combination with the indicators covered in the first menu, these four additional focus areas reflect some of the conditions that are needed to secure an array of socioeconomic rights, as well as the realization of inclusive and productive societies. For instance, access to WASH is key for public health and the overall functioning of society. Attacks on water treatment plants can leave hundreds of thousands without access to water, including key infrastructures such as hospitals, unable to function. Children are particularly susceptible to the impacts of unsafe water and sanitation, both from a health and developmental perspective. Children under five are 20 times more likely to die from diarrheal diseases linked to unsafe water and sanitation than they are from actual violence and conflict. Disruption to water, water and sanitation also impacts children's schooling as they are most often tasked with fetching water when household access is disrupted. Similarly, food security is essential for people's survival, development, and their ability to live a productive life. Disruptions in the structure of agriculture and elements of the food supply chain renders entire societies food insecure. Food insecure leads to malnutrition, diseases, displacement, and destabilizations of societies. Societies can become trapped in a vicious cycle of hunger and conflict, where hunger contributes to violent conflict, which in turn leads to more hunger. We see a similar cycle occurring between armed conflict and the environment. The conflict degrades the natural environment and depletes natural resources, both of which are closely linked with national, regional, and international stability. Environmental degradation also affects public health. Debris and rubble produced by armed conflict pollute the surrounding air, soil, and water with chemicals and heavy metals, endangering the lives of those who continue to inhabit these areas long after the conflict has ended. In addition to these compounding impacts and risks, disruption from armed conflict reverses economic growth, hinders recovery and developmental efforts. This is, occurs at both a societal and an individual level. The lack of economic opportunities and obstacles to earning a livelihood are harmful impacts in and of themselves, but they also aggravate the effects of other impacted areas. Moreover, growing competition of scarce resources increase tensions that may trigger further violence, adding yet another grave negative reinforcing loop that amplifies undesirable effects. As these four focus areas go to show, the use of explosive weapons in populated areas have complex and highly interconnected reverberating effects on societies and individuals. Next slide, please. Thank you. These indicators, the metrics presented as indicators originated from a literature review of publicly available sources and an analysis of the applicable sustainable development goals, including their associate targets and indicators. The indicators, as I'll further explain, were cataloged sequ sequ sequentially. The order is designed to illuminate the causal pathway, which in turn 
The hope is that users of this menu of indicator will work through across, will work through the three levels to map out the reverbering effects to the greatest extent possible. Lastly, the complete menu of indicators underwent an extensive peer review process, which also included potential users of this tool. This was in order to provide feedback on the applicability and readiness of the metrics to capture the underground realities of affected populations. Now to get to the heart of what matters, the indicators. The second menu of indicators contains 73 indicators across four focus areas. These include 21 indicators for WASH, 15 for food security, 19 for environmental degradation, and 18 for economic opportunity. The indicators presented in the table are an attempt to capture and document some of the complex and compounding reverberating effects from the use of the loop. Next slide, please. As an example, you can see here the first and second level indicators for the WASH focus area. And I'd like to take this moment to explain a few key points. Some of the indicators come with the option of an alternative indicator. These are different measures that capture a similar or equivalent outcome to the intended focus indicator. They are included when two or more ways to capture the outcome are valid, or when the suggested indicator presents significant data or methodological limitations. For instance, as you can see in the case of indicator 2C here, when seeking to measure shortages of electricity needed to keep water and sanitation services function, one could easily measure the proportion of the electrical grid that is facing total or partial service related disruption, or simply measure the number of hours per day with electricity and compared use to the pre-conflict level. Next slide, please. Lastly, on other occasions, two suggested indicators for one focus area are included. In comparison to the alternative indi indicators, which are practically identical, these capture slightly different outcomes, which are both still aligned with the overall focus and spirit of the indicator. This is the case, for example, with indicator 3C here. When measure poor hygiene and waste management, due to disruptions in waste management services, one could either measure the proportion of the population that is using safely managed sanitation services, as is the case with the SDG shown here, or measure the proportion of the population that is taking part in the open burning of waste. While the outcomes of these two indicators are clearly different, they nevertheless both capture the impact of disruptive water and waste management services. We hope that this has given you an insight and a taste of the indicators and clarified how they are supposed to be used. And I'll turn back to my colleague Alfredo for the remainder of the presentation. Thank you, Francesca. Very clear. Now, in the spirit of working together, I just want to quickly outline our path moving forward. One, we stand ready to provide advice in conducting studies and discussing the topic more in depth. And two, we're committed to review, integrate, and consider lessons learned and critical feedback. We recognize that some ideas will hold water while others won't. So we're releasing this publication again in the spirit of working together for the protection of civilians, but doing so with great humility. Finally, I would also like to use this opportunity to encourage everyone here to think about reverberating effects as feedback loops, since these effects are cumulative, interact, and intersect meaning that civilians can be affected in more ways than one. I wish to conclude our intervention with our three objectives for these publications. Concretely, one, to assist research efforts documenting the broad range and scale of harms from the use of a weapon. Two, to help identify the general and foreseeable patterns of harm resulting from the use of a weapon. Three, to help prioritize the protection of civilians when planning and conducting operations. I wish to thank the UNIDI staff for making this publication and event possible, in particular, Theo Bayon, Paul Holton, Matilde Vecchioni, and Erika Monfort. I wish to thank you all for participating in this event with us. Please know that my email is always open. The links to the new publications, the new publication and the first menu of indicators are also now live on the chat. And now over to Paul. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Alfredo. Thank you, Francesca, for that very clear introduction to the second menu of indicators. Um, I greatly appreciated you highlighting some of the key methodological matters and an explanation of some of the, the critical indicators for these new areas that we're looking at of WASH, food security, environmental degradation, and economic opportunities. Um, I'm also greatly appreciative of you sharing a glimpse of the, of the tables from the final report. As you know, um, I greatly appreciate reviewing these extensively. I'd love to see a full table in a, in a presentation as well, especially when I know that the tremendous amount of work that went into putting those together. And I recommend uh, many of the people on this um, meeting today to take a look through them and analyze them. And as, as Alfredo said, we're very open 
to, to feedback on these and, and especially their use, but also some of their limitations and some thinking around alternatives um, that you think might be useful as we, we seek to keep these as living documents and uh, use the experience and expertise of many of you on this call and your colleagues for advancing this agenda. Um, with that, and without any further ado, uh, we'll now hear from Dominique Gasawa. Uh, Dominique is the Civil Military Coordinati Coordination Focal Point at the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, OCHA. And as part of her work at OCHA, Dominique has served as the Humanitarian Affairs Officer from 2014 through to 2020. And prior to joining OCHA, she held several roles within Médecins Sans Frontières, from the Field Coordinator to Family Focal Point Coordinator. And she's also worked for the Fondation Suisse de Déménage, as well as for the European Commission Humanitarian Office. And, and we are really delighted that you're able to join us this afternoon, and we very much look forward to hearing from you. So without any further ado, the screen is over to you. Please, Dominique. Thank you very much, Paul, and, uh, and to Unidir and the whole team for the excellent work that you've done on, on the two menu of indicators. They're, they're really important tools in bridging that space between the area of impact, if you like, and us understanding what uh, the impact is of, these, uh, of the use of explosive weapons in populated areas, not only obviously in the, in the immediate term, but also in the longer term. Um, today, I'd really like to speak and, and compliment the presentations that were made by Alfredo and Francesca and speak to the wider UN effort that is behind um, the advocacy on, on the use of explosive weapons, because with the United Nations unique setup, we have many operational agencies uh, working on the ground, helping communities deal with the immediate impact of the use of explosive weapons, and as many of the participants in today's event know the uh, the figures keep rising. Uh, the Secretary General recently at uh, his remarks for the Security Council on urban warfare at the end of January mentioned that 15 million people today are living in areas afflicted by urban conflict. And we all know that urbanization is growing. Um, and this also means that the risk of conflict occurring in uh, urban areas is also increasing. But of course, populated areas also uh, include areas that are not urban conflicts, but can also be uh, displacement camps or refugee camps. And we've seen uh, and heard allegations of the use of such weapons recently in, in many different contexts from Ethiopia to Syria and um, and many others across the world. So the UN in its uh, response in, in addressing the, the humanitarian needs that come from the use of these weapons is, is vast. And the, uh, the, the interesting element of the menu of indicators is the linkage with the sustainable development goals. In the Secretary General's disarmament agenda of 2018, for example, the nexus between the disarmament and the uh, making disarmament and in having an impact on human uh, life and survival and dignity in situations of conflict is very much reinforced, which is why linking this menu of indicators with the sustainable development goals is very, very key. And many of our partner agencies uh, work with uh, implementing partners and NGOs in the ground, on the ground to help address these needs. UNICEF, for example, in its focus on child protection, focused its, uh, its Water Under Fire report series on the impact of water and sanitation uh, infrastructure that is affected or destroyed in, in the, with the use of, of uh, explosive weapons and uh, urban conflict. We also have HCR, the, the, the High Commission for Refugees that addresses the situations of displacement, which, cause, which are caused in many uh, cases by extensive warfare, including the use of uh, explosive weapons in populated areas. We have agencies like UNMAS, for example, who are key in providing assistance, victim assistance to millions, to thousands of people in, in contexts. In Syria, most recently, over 13,000 people were, assist, were assisted thanks to UNMAS and its partners working to assure victim assistance, not only for immediate healthcare, but also physical rehabilitation, for example. Um, OCHA in its coordination role really tries to bring together um, the humanitarian partners 
and ensuring that they have access to the communities most affected in situations of armed conflict. And this, this is very challenging, especially when uh, the use of explosive weapons is, is a risk factor, not only for our own teams on the ground that have to provide that assistance, but also ensuring that the material supplies get through to the areas where they are most needed. Um, but the UN also engages on the political level and there the Office for the Disarmament Affairs is key in also ensuring that disarmament um, takes into account the, the multi-layered impact of uh, the use of explosive weapons and the broader disarmament agenda at that. Um, our position is very much you know, um, mo driven by the Secretary General's position on this and he has been very clear Mr. Guterres, but also the preceding um, Secretary General since 2009 have been calling for states to address the, the issues and the, the humanitarian impact of the use of explosive weapons in populated areas. And his message is, is, is very clear. And it, it cam comes down to getting states to recognizing uh, the fact that the use of these weapons has aggravating uh, and long-term impact on civilians and civilian objects, which also have an impact not only on their immediate survival, but also the prospects for peace, reconciliation, and bringing people back uh, to their communities and rebuild their lives after conflicts are, are resol resolved or, or at least in a lull. And it's also looking at how states can improve their conduct um, and making sure that good military practice is shared across the board. And here there's a growing evidence base on uh, good military practice that can help reduce the impact of uh, explosive weapons in populated areas. OCHA uh, published a compilation back in 2017 on military practices, and there have been other very important publications that have followed since um, by NGOs such as Article 36, and also, of course, the ICRC, as was mentioned previously in its most recent um, report. So just as a last note, um, 2022 for us is really a critical juncture and we very much look forward to the consultations organized by Ireland um, being able to be organized soon. Uh, the momentum has been, uh, has been kept up and that's thanks very much to civil society organizations, the Red Cross movement, the UN, and of course member states keeping that momentum in difficult times when there are many, many challenges uh, facing the international community. Um, and yet, this is a very important cause. It's an important time. And the Secretary General's message, in a way, carries us all through this um, and, and making sure that that momentum is maintained. So thank you very much, Paul. I look forward to the discussion that will follow. And um, I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dominique, for that extremely useful overview of the UN system-wide efforts to prevent civilian harm and assisting parties to conflicts to make protection of civilians a, a real strategic priority, including that focus on, on EWIPA. Um, I'm very grateful from my perspective for sort of answering clearly what the UN is doing to prevent and mitigate civilian harm across different um, agencies. I think that was extremely helpful. And you also provided a fantastic link uh, with our final panelist when mentioning the evidence that's being conducted by a, a range of NGOs, uh, including Article 36 and also, of course, the International Committee of the Red Cross regarding this domain and in particular those uh, identifying good military practices uh, that, that can be utilised going forward. Um, I see a few questions coming in in the Zoom Q&A, so please keep them coming in for our previous speakers. And also, I'm confident that, that our, our next speaker will also hopefully stimulate some discussion and some thoughts, because finally, we're going to hear from Laura Boilo, the program manager for Article 36. Uh, in this role, Laura is the coordinator for the International Network on Explosive Weapons, INU, an international network of NGOs that's calling for stronger international standards to prevent human suffering from the use of explosive weapons in towns, cities, and other populated areas. Uh, Laura previously worked as campaign manager and subsequently director of the Cluster Munition Coalition, and Laura will be the final presentation for this expert panel, and I can't wait. So Laura, please, over to you. Thanks very much, Paul, and thanks to all of the UNIDIR team for inviting me to join the, the panel today and also for all of your excellent, excellent work on uh, producing this report. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. 
Um, as said, I'm speaking here on behalf of INU. We are an international network of civil society organizations that's working to prevent harm uh, and human suffering from the use of explosive weapons in towns, cities, and other populated areas. INU is made up of member organizations. Some uh, work in and with communities that have experienced directly the impact of explosive weapon use. And many of our members uh, undertake research and data collection to better understand civilian harms from the use of explosive weapons across uh, a number of different contexts. Collectively, we draw on much of this research and lived experiences of people to inform our policy recommendations on how to address this issue that's requiring urgent attention. From our work, it is evident that the use of explosive weapons in populated areas causes a, a persistent and a widespread pattern of harm. And this has been documented across a range of different contexts. And whilst the reverberating effects can be less immediately visible than direct effects, they can extend beyond the weapons impact area, lasting for days, months, or even years after bombing has stopped and they can far outweigh the immediate civilian death toll from an attack. These effects often result from the damage and destruction of housing and infrastructure and the, the subsequent disruption to services, which are often essential in meeting the needs of the civilian population. As towns and uh, city centers are often hubs for critical infrastructure and because much of it is uh, interconnected and interdependent, Attacks in populated areas um, that disrupt a particular service, say a, a power station, for example, increases the probability that it will cause disruption to the provision of other services, causing knock-on reverberating effects, such as uh, the, the ability of hospitals to function that are reliant on, on power supplies in order to treat patients. Attacks involving explosive weapons can be instantly debilitating, but in contexts where fighting is protracted and there are cumulative attacks, the situation for civilians is significantly exacerbated. So these are um, effects that are often experienced on a, a large scale. And I want to take a few minutes to illustrate what this means in reality um, by looking at a few different examples and drawing on some of the areas that the report looks at, namely water and sanitation, healthcare, food security and the environment. In eastern Ukraine, shelling over several years has caused significant damage and destruction to water systems. This includes filter stations and pipelines. As documented in different reports by PACS and by UNICEF and in humanitarian uh, situation reports from OCHA, it's clear that this damage has interrupted uh, the supply of water, which has impeded access to water for both drinking and hygiene purposes, and often for long periods of time. It's also reduced the quality of water, which has increased the risks of waterborne diseases. And at the start of last year, an estimated 3.1 million people were still in need of water and sanitation and other humanitarian assistance due to persistently inadequate water, sanitation and hygiene. Taking a look at food security, um, academics Sowers and Weintal have conducted research on attacks on infrastructure in the Middle East region. And this includes looking at the impact of attacks on the agricultural sector in Yemen. Um, this includes farms, fishing boats, food producers and processors, storage and transportation facilities. And they found that attacks, uh, particularly extensive airstrikes, has undercut livelihoods and food security, which has contributed to Yemen's humanitarian crisis, including widespread child malnutrition. Humanity and inclusion has also documented the impact that airstrikes have had on the Hodeida port in Yemen in 2015. This is Yemen's largest port and it's a lifeline for food security. And the attacks um, resulted in a rise in food prices impacting um, across all of Yemen. In terms of healthcare, data provided by Insecurity Insight for INU's Explosive Weapons Monitor has documented incidents last year where healthcare has been in impacted by explosive weapon use. In most cases, attacks on hospitals and medical facilities has meant that healthcare services were suspended as a result, often for a substantial period of time and reducing patients' ability to access services. One incident included a rocket attack which struck a maternity room in Tigray, Ethiopia, resulting in its closure. 
Um, and this in a country where it has one of the highest infant mortality rates in the world. In terms of environmental impact, in Gaza in May last year, airstrikes hit an agrochemical supply warehouse estimated to have stored 300 tons of hazardous pesticides. Smoke and fumes from the warehouse fires lasted for weeks, causing hospitalizations due to respiratory problems, and this amid the COVID pandemic. And the full impact on the soil, water, and crops in this area is still not known. Other environmental challenges arise from dealing with the huge volumes of debris from collapsed buildings. In Aleppo, there was an estimated 15 million tonnes of debris, 7 to 8 million tonnes in Mosul, and 5.3 million tonnes in Homs. So the challenges of dealing with such huge volumes of debris are immense, and particularly when explosive remnants of war and other hazardous materials are in amongst the rubble. And groups like the Conflicts and Environment Observatory and PACS are doing a lot to bring attention to this. So these experiences and other experiences of civilian harm in recent conflicts are severe and they're substantial and they underscore um, the importance of giving due weight to the full extent of harms. This also makes research in this area particularly challenging and so I think the indicators that UNIDIR has developed are going to be a really important tool for both mapping out um, and understanding the different ways that people and communities are impacted from explosive weapon use but also for being able to think about how we turn to address it, enable to both respond to it and, and prevent it. So I'd like to turn now to look at how we can better address this issue in terms of protecting civilians. On the one hand, there is increasing recognition around reverberating effects from explosive weapon use. And I think in large part, this is due to the extensive amount of research that's been undertaken by organizations on this issue. And with this growing documentation of um, the impact of reverberating effects, I think we can better understand and be more aware of the, the likely um, effects of explosive weapon use. And in turn, the impacts become more predictable and more foreseeable and, and therefore more preventable. And this recognition of reverberating effects has also come increasingly from within armed forces as well, including from experience from conducting urban operations. In NATO's handbook on the protection of civilians, it notes that militaries need to take into account the negative wide area effects of explosive weapons in populated and or urban areas, including foreseeable second and third order effects. So whilst this is promising, on the other hand, it's not necessarily being applied um, in practice and certainly not to the extent that it should be. The ICRC's uh, recent report on explosive weapons with wide area effects notes that while the reverberating effects of heavy explosive weapon use in populated areas is well documented and foreseeable, it's doubtful whether parties to conflict appropriately factor into their assessment, uh, factor these into their assessment of the lawfulness of such use. But this is an area where I hope we'll see changes over the coming years, and particularly from this growing recognition, but also from the ongoing political declaration process. And I'm going to close now by just saying a few final words on the important opportunity that the political declaration provides um, for strengthening the protection of civilians, including from the reverberating effects. Um, from our perspective, describing and acknowledging the harms that we're concerned about through the political declaration text is important. It can help to uh, create greater awareness of the risks to civilians, including from damage and destruction of buildings and critical infrastructure. And it can also help to ensure that these effects can be anticipated in certain contexts. And the draft text of the declaration recognizes and describes the reverberating effects from explosive weapon use on civilian populations. And in the consultations, we've heard a number of states um, support this uh, in the text. But fundamentally, the utility of the political declaration is as a tool to guide militaries in shaping operational policies and, and changing practice. The centerpiece of a political declaration should be a commitment on states to avoid using explosive weapons when they have wide area effects in populated areas due to the inherent risk of harm to civilians. This would provide the strongest protection to civilians from uh, death and injury, whilst also uh, reducing the risk of damage and destruction of uh, critical infrastructure. Uh, beyond this, a commitment that requires states to 
take into account the direct and reverberating effects which can be uh, reasonably foreseen in the planning of military operations um, is also important and will be a, a key commitment that's in the, the current draft text. Um, so just in closing, within INU, we are very much looking forward to the, the consultations uh, resuming again very soon, we hope, um, and beyond this working over the coming years to ensure that this declaration has a, a meaningful impact in practice. And I think the indicators that, that UNIDIR have developed are going to be uh, very helpful for the, the implementation phase of work under the declaration too. Thank you very much. And thank you, Laura, for providing some very concrete examples of documented patterns of harm relating to the indicators that are contained in this second menu of indicators provided by UNIDIR. Um, we found that extremely useful to, to link up, but also the way in which you sort of provided a nice bookend to the discussion, calling back on the political declaration and some of your recommendations and expectations also with regard to not just the declaration, but its operationalization and how this can potentially be moved forward and where research provided by your network, but also by other entities can also be useful in moving this issue forward. And indeed, the, the, the commitments that we all have towards reducing uh, civilian harm in these in these contexts. If this were a meeting in person, this is where I'd pause to ask for a round of applause for some fantastic uh, presentations to begin with. As it's virtual, uh, I won't be asking that. Um, but what I will say is that I think we've had some excellent presentations. I see some questions in, in, the, in the chat and I will now be turning to ask a couple of those questions to our panelists. Please, you have a couple more minutes in which to provide any additional questions if you feel that that's appropriate. Unfortunately, the way that they've come in, I think what I can do is I can go with sort of the reverse order for the opening remarks for a couple of questions. And so, Laura, I'm going to put the spotlight back on you in a moment um, with, with a couple of questions that, that I think you touched upon in your presentation, but which I think we are happy to give you a few more moments to elaborate upon. Uh, and the first is sort of, you know, what, why from your perspective and that of the rest of your network, are these explosive weapons particularly problematic when it comes to their use in an, in an urban context? And furthermore, you indicated, you know, there's research has been undertaken and a collation, a collation of good practices with regards to what militaries can do to take into account the reverberating effects. But I guess it'd be great if you could sort of share a couple of examples that, that come to mind there. So I'll turn the screen back to you now. Thanks very much, Paul. Um, well, I think um, one of the characteristics of uh, explosive weapons in terms of how they, they, they function and work is they exert very uh, powerful forces that are uh, capable of, of seriously damaging and destroying uh, buildings and infrastructure. And so, you know, this is also a very important uh, part of the perceived military utility of uh, some of these types of heavy explosive weapons. Um, but as mentioned, our concerns are particularly with regards to um, explosive weapons when they have wide area effects and when they're used um, in a populated area where that wider area is likely to contain civilians and civilian objects. So here we see that from the, the very powerful blast uh, wave and the fragmentation effects, it can cause uh, buildings to collapse, sometimes even neighboring structures um, beyond those that are directly hit. Um, and sometimes across wider surroundings. We also see problems when multiple explosive weapons or inaccurate explosive weapon systems are used um, where they end up hitting buildings within an area that are perhaps not the intended targets. So um, because also public infrastructure is located in towns and cities, I think this presents a particular elevated risk of damage to to healthcare and education facilities, water and, and sanitation systems, which greatly exacerbates the impact of conflict and the, the provision of these services, particularly at times when the civilian population is in dire need of, of healthcare um, and many other um, uh, essential services like this. In terms of um, what militaries can do, um, I think one of the key things that um, that we see here is that militaries uh, need to undertake prior assessment of the the area effects of their uh, it, of their weapon systems, and and think also about how they play out uh, in an urban environment where there's uh, buildings and other other in infrastructure uh, in that area. Doing this prior to attacks would help to um, be able to assist in decision making, but also. Um, should guide in the direction of avoiding use uh, in the first place. 
We'd also like to see um, more uh, assessment by militaries. And I realize it's a very broad group and some uh, already do this, but we'd like to see it done more, more widely, more systematically. Um, of the specific context of use um, and uh, conducting operations in the urban environment. And I think uh, drawing more on input from engineers and other technical um, expertise to understand how and where critical infrastructure is located and, and what the knock-on effects are to civilians when uh, these are taken out in, in uh, urban situations. So I'll leave it there, thank you. Thank you so much, Laura, not just for answering my question, but also I think for a couple that I saw even coming up as you were speaking, you were able to very quickly respond. Uh, and actually from, from your intervention and the questions I'm seeing coming in, um, I'd like now to turn to, to, to Dominique on, on a couple of points here. Um, you were very helpful in terms of providing an overview of, of what the UN sort of has been doing and what it, it's, it's working on currently. But I guess two questions for you is, you know, what else do you think the UN system can do to help parties to conflict uh, to, to sort of go forward as the, the, the Secretary General sort of referred to in his, his recent statements. Uh, and also I'm just thinking, given one of the questions that's come in, um, OCHA's compilation of military policy and practice, it provides some useful uh, practices as has been referred to already. And we have a question about sort of how confident are we of the ability of the, 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 the conclusions and recommendations to military forces and indeed these good practices shared in OCHA's documentation being carried forward and being used by uh, military forces for positive action. So I think it picks up on a couple of the points that, that Laura gave there, but, but Dominique, I'm happy to hear from you on this issue as well, given that the extensive work you and your colleagues have undertaken on this issue. So the screen's over to you. Thank you, Paul, um, and thank you for the excellent questions. Um, I think I'll start with the, the question of, of the, uh, the military practices and, and what is the sense that we're getting from our, our, our partners or interlocutors on the military side um, in, in being receptive to these, um, to, these, uh, to these notions. I mean, we work as the Civil Military Coordination Service at OSHA, we work very closely with uh, militaries around the world in the global south, but obviously also in the north, um, to look at the conduct hostilities and, and we engage in, in, on many levels with them. And the sense that we do get is that there is a growing awareness and recognition of the need to incorporate uh, protection of civilians policies and thinking into the military conduct um, on, on the ground. Um, and that's that we see across the board and uh, Laura already cited uh, NATO's POC handbook, um, which is a very, very important standard setter. I mean, as you all probably know, NATO has training and, and mentoring partnerships with many countries beyond the NATO alliance. Um, so it's, it also sets the tone for many other countries. So we're relatively confident there. Where we do feel a bit of pushback is the sense that there is still a hesitation as to the extent to which, you know, the conduct of hostilities is no longer primarily against other regular armed forces, but often against non-state armed groups, and the extent to which the declaration or an in, in increasing the normative or heightening the normative standard would necessarily also apply to the adversaries. And this is where engagement with non-state armed groups is also extremely important in raising awareness and, and influencing their um, uh, conduct of hostilities and, and their respect for IHL, which is of course also applies to those groups. So that's going to be an additional element that we need to work on closely with partners um, and, and those organizations that either have direct access to those groups um, and, and building common messages around that. Um, when it comes to next steps on, on what we can do forward, it's, it's, it's basically continuing this uh, building the evidence base and showing that protection of civilians and the respect for IHL and the conduct of hostilities that's adapted to urban environments are not mutually exclusive. Already in 2020, uh, the Secretary General in his annual report on the protection of civilians highlighted the need for um, uh, parties to conflict to recognize that urban settlements settings have different consequences for uh, civilians and this has to be taken on to, into consideration when developing military practice. So we come back to that element which is really key in this. Um, so I think 
the key is engaging with uh, with uh, governments and member states at different levels. We know that states are not monolithic entities. Um, Belgium, for example, is a very good example. The parliament recently um, passed a resolution supporting the adoption of an avoidance policy. Um, where we know that you know as a member state the government uh, might still have some reticencies so it's really getting that message through all the different levels engaging with uh, ministries of defense the military side and also look at how can we practically address the concerns uh, to reduce the civilian harm because the figures are are flagrant and very telling uh, when the same weapons are used in urban or populated areas the extent to which civilians are the victims of those attacks are are three or fourfold sometimes so it's really making sure that the evidence base is there that it grows that it is known and that member states are engaging with us to see how we can help them adapt that, those policies that exist um, so i think I'll, I'll stop there thank you wonderful thank you so much dominique for giving some, some some more concrete examples following on from your presentation i think very helpful in response to the questions posed by our participants in this meeting uh, with that i'll turn to my colleagues at unidir uh, to alfredo and also to francesca uh, we have the question about the methodology what methodologies could you use to measure the contribution of a weeper to third level indicators such as the proportion of the population using safely managed drinking water services laura's given some some concrete examples there but the question has also been posed about how to show attribution and the measure of contribution of IWIPA in these circumstances where you could have a very long causal chain and other external factors not related to IWIPA could be influencing this factor. So I'm not sure whether Alfredo or Francesca feels brave enough to take this one, but I'll uh, pass that one to one of you to address now, please. Thank you, Paul, and thank you for that question. It's indeed a challenge, but I will do my best. I, I do want to start by saying that when endeavoring to conduct this research, it is almost important to do so with humility because this question hits the nail in the head that attribution versus contribution is a really delicate topic, meaning that attribution is a sole cause, whereas contribution means that it could have contributed to that outcome. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good space to pause and, and, and ask to be cautious when doing this research and claiming that this is because of this. With that said, if I think there's a part of the question that I think is it, it's key that the impact change is very long. And indeed, when the impact change is very long, then many other exogenous factors or external factors can influence the observed outcome. However, when the impact change, impact chain is very clear and damage and destruction to pumps or other critical infrastructure is well documented and you see the immediate effect working its way through the layers of indicators, then the observed outcome can be accredited to some extent to the initial damage and destruction with some uh, confidence. With that said, again, I think we always advocate for three different levels of confidence to manage certainty and uncertainty. Um, when uncertain, I think it is safest to say that merits deeper WIPA related research, knowing that this could have contributed towards the observed outcome, but it's not necessarily a sole cause for it. Another possible way to go about this is to do Statistical techniques using a difference in difference, which compares service levels pre-shock against the service levels after the shock and compare the difference in those. You can also use a counterfactual scenario, meaning that you can observe the context where the infrastructure was damaged, the pumps were hurt against a scenario that was not affected by the use of explosive weapons and see what the difference is. And from there, you can start drawing a narrative. I would say that changes are key in reverberating effects research, what you want to see is not static outcomes, but changes and how things evolve, especially if compared to baseline data. That's one of the most important takeaways from, from this question. And again, I would like to take this opportunity to reiterate that we are mapping patterns of harm and to use the cumulative experience that we have, as opposed to just reaching or jumping to conclusions on um, specific events. Uh, I think it's a great question, a great methodological question. I'm fully available to discuss methodological queries after the event as well. I am fascinated by this. I am a strong supporter of difference in differences. I think they, they, they show changes very well. And um, yes, and I call for humility and caution when doing this. Thank you. And back to you, Paul. Thanks, and Alfredo. And I can attest to your um, interest in discussing methodologies at great length. 
So please, if you do have any questions on these issues, uh, please follow up with Alfredo. He shared his email address uh, already on the screen and uh, it's also available via Unidea's website. Uh, I now have another question to address to Dominique and then another one for Laura. So I'll, um, I'll ask them both and then I'll turn the screens to you in turn. So for you first, Dominique, um, there's a lot of indicators and suggestions of how data can be collected, but is there any single organization that's charged with collection and collation of data? Um, so this is, is it left just to individual organizations? Uh, and this is something that's been addressed explicitly to you and to Archa. So I'll pass to you, Dominique, in a moment for that one. And then secondly, for Laura, uh, the question is raised that research findings can help predict and foresee impacts, but what measures do you think could be used to implement to mitigate these impacts? And so that's a quite a broad question. So again, uh, if you have any specific examples, then, then, then please feel free to share. But Dominique, I'll pass to you first. Thank you, Paul, and um, and thank you again for, for another excellent question. Um, there is no, no single prescribed entity with the UN which is uh, responsible for data collection. So all the different operational agencies and OCHA as well have uh, different methodological tools that they use to um, to do needs assessments or impact assessments, uh, especially in, in humanitarian crisis situations. Now, what OCHA does do is try and uh, coordinate assessments um, and and in some cases we have what are called um, multi-indicator risk assessments mirrors that we do in 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 sudden onset disasters um, and there what we, we've tried to do actually with unidir is see how we can use the indicators and incorporate them into existing assessment tools um, so we're in the process of, of working with unidir on that uh, because the indicators set that have been developed by uh, by Unidir, not only this one, but the first menu indicators as well, is extremely useful as well. And, and the methodological rigor that was applied is, is quite extraordinary. Um, and so, so no, there is no uh, set agency or entity that's responsible for this. But as OCHA, we're going to try as much as possible to, to basically use our platforms and networks to ro help roll out the menu of indicators, make them accessible to, uh, to different humanitarian organizations as well, and see how we can basically, you know, support the multiplier effect. But, um, but unfortunately, we don't have a, a single needs assessment because every, every entity has their own uh, thematic focus and, and their own tool sets, um, but they do complement each other and, uh, and they can definitely influence each other. So having, you know, an eye on a weeper and, and that knowledge will already be able to permeate other existing assessment tools. So we hope that that in itself will help build an interest and uh, and in turn improve evidence collection, which then obviously will, will help further our advocacy efforts. I hope that was uh, comprehensible. Thanks. And I think gave a very clear explanation. And Laura, over to you now for the final question of this round. Thank you. Thanks very much. And uh, thanks for the question also. Um, so thinking about the the research findings and uh how these can help to uh foresee impacts and um the measures that could be implicated to mitigate the impacts i think uh, this speaks a lot to the sorts of commitments that we would like to see in the political declaration i mean this is a tool where we would like to see clear action or oriented um commitments that uh require states to change their policies and change their practices all aimed at better protecting uh, civilians from the use of explosive weapons in populated areas. Here, fundamentally, I think the main commitment um, or measure we would like to see is uh, a requirement on states, uh, militaries, not to use explosive weapons when they have wide area effects in populated areas or some other formulation that establishes this presumption um, against use. I think this is the most practical way to prevent the sorts of harm that we're concerned about. Um, we would also like to see measures where uh, states are making changes to military policies and military practices. So reviewing the procedures and the policies that they have um, and making civilian uh, protection a strategic uh, priority. Another important area that we would like to see in the political declaration and a key measure here um, uh, commitments to gather and share data. And this is across a, a range of different areas. 
One is tracking civilian harm during military operations. I think this can help to ensure that um, military operations are responsive to incidents in real time so that they can adjust their practice and uh, be responsive to um, incidents of civilian harm, as well as being um, uh, transparent and accountable and being able to um, investigate instances where there have been civilian casualties. Um, but these can also help to inform uh, future military operations. We'd also like to see um, stronger data gathering on the use of explosive weapons. So the types being used, the, the locations um, and the effects. Um, as well as on the impact on civilians, so civilian casualties, as well as uh, the impact on civilian infrastructure. I think understanding the impact in these different areas is going to help us to um, be able to mitigate uh, and mitigate harm and also be more responsive in responding to um, the needs of uh, people that have been affected, both in terms of uh, medical needs, um, psychosocial support, social inclusion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura, for that excellent answer as well. Um, and I'd just like to thank all of the panelists for their fantastic presentations and for so eloquently and uh, comprehensively answering some, some good challenging questions posed by our participants in this meeting. What I'd like to do now is to give each of the, the panelists um, uh, 30 seconds or to a minute, I've been told you've got to basically give a sort of a, a main takeaway or, or a summary of the, the key points that you'd like uh, to share with, with all of the participants today uh, before we close this meeting. And with that, I propose we, we go back to the original order. And so, John, uh, please, I'll open the floor for you to have a, a few final words. Um, maybe you've got some dates already uh, during this meeting for, for when the, the negotiations can take place. But, but if not, um, please, we're, we're wel we'd welcome your, your final remarks. Uh, over to you, please. Thanks, Paul. Thanks very much. Yeah, we have some dates in, in pencil, but they're not quite in pen yet. So once they become uh, set, we'll, we'll be in touch. You know, I might just take a little bit longer than 30 seconds here. So I, I apologize in advance, but there's a couple of various ones to come in on. I think it's quite important for their inclusive, inclusivity implementation and then just uh, some points on, on avoidance. We've heard calls for greater inclusivity in any follow on activities to ensure that not only states, but also international organizations and civil society play an active role in the implementation of the political declaration. This is something that we are keen to reflect the text and uh, be an essential element in ensuring that the, the declaration has a long term positive impact. With regard to implementation, you know, that question is, is a very important one from our perspective, but for now, we're entirely focused on elaborating the best possible text with the widest possible adherence, implementation and follow up of that, uh, follow up as part of that discussion. So it'll be very much subject to negotiation. It'll be critical therefore to have collective ownership of this text and its implementation. After all, we hope that reaching an agreement on the declaration is really just the beginning rather than the end of the process. And then next uh, to the, the point on uh, avoidance, We've been clear that this process does not aim to create new legal standards uh, or to develop a prohibition on the specific uh, on the use of a specific weapon. Rather, Ireland is seeking to find the maximum level of consensus on a political declaration that enhances jail compliance and delivers genuine behaviour change in order to better protect civilians. We note there is a clear call that the declaration should send a strong political message to address the known harms caused by UEFA and emphasize the consequences of their use. At the same time, a large number of delegations are keen to ensure that the declaration does not imply that all uses of explosive weapons are inherently unlawful. So further work there is needed, and we recognize that you know, we're, we're working really hard, and we will continue to work really hard to get the balance right. Nevertheless, from our perspective, the political declaration must have commitments that are meaningful, and it must bring added value. It must reflect our shared commitments to the protection of civilians and to reducing harm. After all, this is the fundamental reason for Ireland's engagement in the process. Um, I'd just like to conclude by thanking all of the participants for their really stimulating presentations. I found it really insightful. Thank you so much. I'd also like to reiterate Ireland's support for Unidir and all of your fantastic research work. Uh, you're really helping to uh, to enhance and broaden the understanding of the impact of the use of the UEPA and that, and I for one truly appreciate that. So thank
thanks. Uh, that's all from me. Thank you, Paul. Pass, pass the floor back to you. Thank you so much, Sean, for your kind words for Unidir and also I think for a very helpful reminder in terms of the purpose again of the declaration and the challenging task that you have in terms of stewarding this and, and guiding this towards a, a meaningful commitments. So I think that's uh, very well taken. Um, I'll pass to my colleagues, Alfredo and or Al Francesca, I'm not sure if you're both speaking or if just one of you, um, but uh, I gave John a little bit longer because he didn't have any questions. We still have a little bit more time, so uh, you've got a, just under a minute, so Alfredo, over to you. I'll be very brief. I have two main takeaway messages. One, if this exercise serves for anything, is and this is my personal opinion, I wish that we think harder about reverberating effects and really spend the time thinking and looking into this issue. My second takeaway message is that we're here to serve, convene, listen, accept criticism, be useful and conducive to our protection of civilians. So with that, feel free to reach out and we start ready to be useful. Over to you, Paul. Thank you, Alfredo, very succinct, very clear. I'll pass now to Dominique, please, your, your final remarks, Dominique. Um, thank you very much for convening this, this excellent session. Um, I think I'll also stay with two final thoughts. Um, the first is when you look at the global humanitarian overview for 2022, we are seeing almost all of our metrics uh, reaching unprecedented levels. Um, with We're requesting $41 billion in humanitarian aid. We've never seen that uh, before. We have over 270 million people in need of humanitarian assistance. Of course, this is not all due to the use of explosive weapons in populated areas, but when we look closely at the, at the countries where the humanitarian needs are highest, there's a very strong correlation in urbanized warfare, in the use of explosive weapons. And then of course, the long-term effects that uh, humanitarians are called upon to, um, to address and, and that is simply not tenable. Um, and the second point is, is one that we all know from, from those of us who, who've studied IHL and, and the, the conduct of hostilities will inform the prospects for peace. Um, and when we look at, um, the figures today and, and the extent to which communities and individuals are, are suffering um, in the short, medium and long term and the communities that are that are trying to rebuild their lives after having been impacted uh, by the use of such weapons, we really need to think very carefully about the choices we make in how we conduct war um, and, and the effect that this has on, on civilians. Um, as uh, as Mr. Uh, the, the German representative spoke today, the, the effects of a WIPA can last for decades beyond the, um, the conduct of hostilities themselves. And in many countries that suffer from that today, they do not have the kind of infrastructure that Germany has today um, to address those. Um, so those would be my, my final thoughts. And thank you very much again for the excellent tool and the excellent uh, meeting today. Thank you, Dominique, for your excellent participation and I think for leaving us with some important reminders about why we're here um, and what we're seeking to address and, and the scale of the challenge that's ahead of us, um, as well as this uh, reminder on the, the long term and the reverberating effects indeed. Uh, and with that, Laura, over to you for your final remarks, please. Thanks very much. Um, well, I just wanted to say I'm very glad to hear that there's some dates in pencil for the uh, final consultations for the political um, declaration negotiations. Within the INU network, we've been waiting, waiting eagerly and uh, patiently and perhaps some uh, quite impatiently as well for the, this final milestone to be reached. And um, I just want to express that we are very appreciative of Ireland's leadership over this process. And I think during quite a difficult time where there's been such um, challenging delays caused by the, the COVID pandemic, which have obviously been unavoidable, but um, their capacity to be able to keep up the momentum has been very important and obviously continue uh, this leadership. Um, and we are very pleased as well to see the, the interest and engagement that I think remains strong as well among uh, many states uh, in, and organizations engaged on this area of work, which I think speaks very much to the, the urgency uh, of this issue and the importance of addressing it. Um, I think uh, the political declaration process provides a really unique opportunity 
to provide a meaningful response to this issue. It's um, an opportunity that doesn't come around very often in this area of work, being involved in developing a new international um, agreement. And it's a very important step along the way. Um, it is just one step along the way. I appreciated everyone who's spoken to the importance of implementation of this um, political declaration. I think this is an area of work where we within INU will be very much um, involved. Um, and as uh, Ireland, I think, said just there before, this is an area of work that we feel needs to be inclusive, involving states and militaries, um, as well as uh, civil society and other organisations. But I think provides a really um, important uh, framework under this political declaration to bring communities together. We all share concern around the, the harm that civilians are facing, and I think all would benefit from working collaborati collab uh, collaboratively to, to address this harm. So we look forward to, to working with you and um, with everyone. And yeah, thanks again to UNIDIR for this very important uh, research report, which I think is going to be very, very useful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, and I'll just conclude by sort of a, a, a remark based on the Secretary General noting in his statement to the Security Council's open debate on war in cities, which took place last month, that you know, parties to conflict should track and learn from allegations of harm to civilians, civilian homes, markets and infrastructure in order to gauge the impact of their operations and find ways to minimise harm. And I think today's event has, has helped to sort of put some meat onto those bones. And indeed, I hope that the EWIPA menu of indicators can be used to capture, measure, compare and understand uh, the, these impacts moving forward with regard to the survival, well-being and dignity of civilians in ways that are often overlooked or, as we said earlier, underestimated. From my side, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for your participation in today's event. And we hope that these fantastic presentations, your stimulating questions and Unidays publications, as well as those of the other entities and rep organizations represented here today, but also mentioned in the interventions can be of use as we move forward, both towards the declaration and as we've all highlighted, its operationaliz operationalization and implementation subsequently. I'd also like to echo Alfredo's thanks uh, to my colleagues that are behind the scenes um, that have made this meeting possible. Uh, my colleagues from the conventional arms and ammunition program here at SIP, uh, here at UNIDIR, in particular, Eric, Matilda and Theo, thanks so much. Um, with that, for those of you in Geneva, thanks for staying with us. I hope you have a great evening around the rest of the world. Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>